Welcome to the Blaze Sports Institute for Applied Science CDSS Level 1 Curriculum. Today's session is uh, Managing Risks in Sport Training and Fitness Programs for Athletes with Physical Disability. And we would like to thank Dr. Jackie McParlin for all of her work in uh, contributing to the content of this presentation. We've uh, built off of her original presentation that took place at our conference in 2010, but without her efforts, uh, we wouldn't have been able to uh, provide you with such a great uh, um, session as what we hope to do for you today. So today we're talking about risk management and disability sports. So some of the things we want to do, we want to make sure that you understand what the risk factors are in sport. Um, once, you, once we go over that, we want to identify and uh, make sure you understand a process that's involved in risk management and determining your risk management plan. And because we are talking about disability sport, uh, you most likely you're not going to have a team physician, a team dentist, an athletic trainer, and a number of other professionals that often could be employed in a sport program. With that being the case, a lot of the duties uh, and risk management concerns fall to the responsibilities of the coach. So we want to make sure that you understand that there are nine legal duties of coaches and what those nine legal duties are. Now this slide is a little test for you that uh, we're going to utilize to see how much of uh, this presentation you've retained by the end. So what I want you to do is memorize uh, this uh, phrase up here, finished files are the results of years of scientific study combined with years of experience. So memorize that. Don't copy it down. Don't take a picture of it. Don't record it. Just commit it to memory. Uh, I'm going to put it up a few more times, give you a few more chances to put that, to convert that from your short term to your long term memory so that you can recall it at the end and uh, pass my little test. Definitions. Uh, when we talk about risk management, uh, there are some definitions that you want to be familiar with. Uh, legal liability is one, and uh, those are the responsibilities and duties between persons that are enforceable by a court. Negligence. What is negligence? Well, it's failing to fulfill your legal duty. And there are two types of negligence. There's contributory negligence and there's comparative negligence. And uh, the difference between the two uh, really gets into um, the courts, and that's where you really want to understand what your state utilizes when determining negligence. If it's a state that ascribes to uh, the contributory model or comparative model, and if it's the comparative model, if it's uh, pure contributor, excuse me, pure comparative or modified comparative model. And the difference is in states that uh, ascribe to the contributory model, if the injured party is in any way at fault for the accident, um, even if it's 2% at fault uh, for the accident, and even though they may be the only injured party as a result of that accident, because they contribute to the accident, by law, they cannot claim any damages. So because their actions helped contribute to the occurrence of the accident and thus the injury, they are not able to collect any damages uh, legally from, from that. Uh, as opposed to that contributory uh, negligence, those states that ascribe to comparative negligence law, uh, comparative negligence, uh, the injured party still can be awarded a settlement even if they are somewhat at fault. And states will use, uh, they will figure out what, how, how, what percentage the injured party was at fault if they contributed 5% in that scenario in a comparative negligence state to the accident. They can still collect uh, monies due to the injury, but it will be reduced due to their contribution probably shouldn't use that word, uh, they'll be reduced as a result of their actions uh, that helped create that accident. And there are, there, again, there are five states that ascribe to contributory negligence. Uh, there are 13 states that follow a pure comparative negligence model, and then there are 33 states that follow a comparative negligence model. And you should spend some time and figure out uh, what state, uh, the state that you're in, what model they follow uh, relative to contributory versus comparative negligence in the court of law. Now, when we think about determining who is negligent when an accident occurs, an injury occurs, um, there are some, of the quest some questions that you want to ask. First, did you have a legal duty to the injured party? Uh, were they a participant in your program? 
Uh, did you provide them with equipment? Did you teach them how to properly use the equipment? Was the equipment properly sized? Was it well maintained? Uh, were you teaching them a skill? Did you teach them that skill properly? Did you teach them that skill in the right order? Were they physically capable and prepared to perform that skill? And then once you start answering all those questions, uh, did you fail to fulfill that duty? Uh, did you give somebody a football helmet to wear that had uh, loose straps, broken screws, and uh, were they injured as a result of that uh, equipment failure? Uh, did you give someone a wheelchair with a cracked frame that broke and they fell out of the chair and were injured? Um, then we look at was the injury to the party was there an injury to the party to whom you owe the duty? So if you're running a wheelchair sports program and you give a participant a chair with a cracked frame and that frame breaks, they fall out of the chair, they break their arm, the answer, at least outside of the court, is fairly clear. Uh, there was injury to a party to whom you owed a duty. And did your failure to fulfill the duty cause that injury? Well, you have a duty to maintain your equipment and put your participants in safe equipment. So you failed to fill that duty, and as a result of failing to fill that duty, a person was injured. And we could look at numerous examples throughout different disability groups, throughout different types of sports and adaptive equipment where we could apply this, but I think you get the idea. And it uh, raises some of the issues that we'll get in later in terms of what are your responsibilities as a coach, and what are your responsibilities in ensuring that you have a good risk management plan and you're providing a safe program. So what is the objective for risk management? Well, um, obviously the first thing is, is we want a safe program. We want to create a safe environment so that we um, have as little chance as possible of anyone getting injured. And ultimately we do that, um, unfortunately, because of the litigious times we live in, we do that in effort so that we do not get sued. Even when someone doesn't necessarily get injured, they could still get sued if an accident occurs. So the safer we make our environment, the less variables are out there, and the better chance we have that everyone can enjoy a safe and effective program and nobody has to call a lawyer. So prevention. It's always easier to prevent an injury than react to an injury. Pre you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And when we talk about prevention, we want to talk about four W's, the who, the where, the when, and the how. And again, when we talk about risk management and the objective of risk management, there are some different levels that we have to deal with. And as you can see here, we have a participant uh, in a bocce program who is using an assistant. Uh, and so this is a ramp player. And the type of risk management issues that we're going to deal with in a bocce program are going to be quite different than the risk management issues that we would encounter if we're dealing with a water ski program especially a water ski program where here you see a sit skier who is jumping off a ramp. So obviously there's a lot more potential for uh, injury, accident and injury, and a lot more variables that we have to take into account with a water ski program than a bocce program. So when we think about the risk management process and developing a risk management plan, uh, there are four things we want to do. And as you can see here, the first thing we want to identify the risks, evaluate the risks, then select an approach to manage the risks, and then finally we want to implement that approach. And again, we can just highlight those here. So again, the four, the four areas, identify the risks, evaluate the risks, select an approach to manage those risks, and then finally implement that approach. The coach's legal duties. And again, some of these uh, would fall under the responsibilities other, of other people if you had them. Uh, an athletic trainer would actually uh, aid in a lot of these duties. But again, because in disability and adapted sports programs, you don't have those other professionals available, these do fall to the coach. And it's important that you understand that the coach does have these legal duties, is properly trained to execute these duties, and then does execute these duties. And those nine duties are properly plan the activity. Well, um, there's a lot that goes into that, and uh, some of that is, uh, is in the other eight points. But again, it should go without saying that if, if you're coaching a program, whether it's a sport program or a physical activity program or recreation program, there should be some thought going into 
what that activity is going to be, how it's going to look, how it's going to progress, where it's going to be, uh, what is the environment, and and it shouldn't just be an off-the-cuff, shoot-from-the-hip kind of endeavor. It needs to be properly planned. Um, and part of that is, as we get into number two, providing proper instruction. Uh, again, not shooting from the hip, not just winging it, but providing proper instruction to the standards of best practice within that sport or that activity so that the participants are learning properly and they're learning uh, in an appropriate progression, uh, their learning skills in an appropriate order. Um, also, number three, warn of inherent risks. And we'll get to this when we talk about waivers and participation agreements. But it's very important that both the participant, and if the participant is a minor, the parents or guardians understand the inherent risks of the activity. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it might uh, not be apparent that uh, it's to someone who's watching uh, a pickup game of wheelchair basketball that is being played very slow. Maybe it's a warm-up. It may not just be common sense that, hey, it is possible to flip backwards out of that chair and hit your head on the floor. Um, you know, it uh, maybe it's not possible or maybe it's not uh, likely if you're providing that water ski program, someone might not understand that, hey, there are ramps out there, and if you go over there, you're going to jump over it. Um, maybe just may not understand that that's something that's even out there within within the course uh, on water on in a water ski program. So you have to make sure that all the participants and if they're minors, their parents or guardians understand all the risks in the, within the program so they can make an informed decision to participate. Uh, provide a safe physical environment. That's just simply making sure that. Uh, the environment that's going to be used for the activity in the surrounding area is safe and free from unnecessary obstacles. Um, I have a great story about this. In 2006, uh, Blaze Sports hosted the U.S. Paralympic Track and Field National Championships. Uh, that event was used to select the World Championship team that year. And uh, we had a long jump pit, a very nice long jump pit that had nice covers on it protecting the sand when it wasn't in use. And the pit itself was about 30 feet long. I mean, it was, it was an extremely long pit. And, of course, the takeoff board was a good four feet in front of the pit. So he had about 34 feet of landing space, and no one was jumping much over 20 feet. And uh, we had removed those covers. And, you know, from uh, an efficiency standpoint, we had just placed them at the end of the pit because, well, who's, no one can possibly jump that far. Well... Uh, the officials working the pit, to the coaches around the pit, the volunteers around the pit, myself as the event director around the pit, all didn't think of our visually impaired long jumpers. And we probably didn't think of it because, again, the pit was so long. But we soon found out that uh, that was not a correct assumption because what happened, one of the premier visually impaired long jumpers on the U.S. team was doing his warm-ups. And even though his coach was right there giving him audible signals to keep him on on the uh, approach track and then uh, giving him the audible signals of when to get ready to jump and to jump and had seen the, seen the covers at the end of the pit, uh, it didn't occur to him either. But we all got a good education when this uh, jumper – was just getting his steps down, and when he's getting, you're getting your steps down, you just simply run through the pit because you're you're getting a feel for the 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 approach uh, to the pit, and he just kept running and running and running till he ran into those covers, fell over the covers, and put a big gash in his hand. So that um, that is a great example of not providing a safe physical environment, and at the same time having to make sure that when you are providing an activity. Uh, for people with disabilities, you're you're considering all the different disabilities and what may or may not happen. And then number five, provide adequate and proper equipment. Well, adequate and proper. Adequate is uh, equipment that uh, uh, you don't want to provide the cheapest, flimsiest equipment. It has to be adequate. It has to meet a certain minimum standard. And proper equipment it has to fit properly. Um, it has to be the right equipment for the right job and it has to be properly fit. Now, this doesn't just mean helmets or pads. This, this uh, can also mean uh, wheelchairs, uh, field implements, shot puts, javelins, discus, 
clubs. Um, you have to make sure that all those th that all the safety equipment that should be used is being used, that it's properly fit, and then also all the equipment that's being used within the activity is proper for the athlete. You don't want to put a men's basketball in the hands of a three-year-old. Just that size difference could actually cause some injury. So you need to make sure that the equipment you're providing is adequate and proper and well-maintained. Uh, match your athletes appropriately. Uh, you need to make sure that uh, you don't, again, you don't put a six-year-old up against a 16-year-old. A lot of different things can happen with that. Evaluate your athletes for injury and incapacity. Uh, when you're dealing with a sports program, you know, athletes are athletes. It doesn't matter if they have a disability or not. They want to play, and if something starts hurting them, which could be a precursor to an injury or a sign of an impending injury, they're not going to tell you. So you have to really get to know your athletes and understand uh, when something doesn't look right, when something's not right with them, and you have to be the safety net for them. Uh, then you also need to supervise the activity closely. You know, you can't just uh, show up, get everything organized, put everybody to work, get them engaged in the activity, and then turn your back and read a book. You need to do your job. You need to watch your participants. You need, if you have uh, volunteers, you have to watch them. If you've got spectators, you need to watch them as well. Uh, and you need to supervise that activity and, and treat it like the job it is. And then finally, if something should happen, you need to provide appropriate emergency assistance. If you are not trained to do it, do not do it. Uh, even if you slept at a Holiday Inn last night, you're not going to provide, provide an emergency tracheotomy with a Bic pen by taking the taking it out and cramming down someone's throat if uh, they're having an allergic reaction and their esophagus closes. You're not going to do that. Do what you're trained to do, and if you're not trained to do anything, you simply call 911. If you're trained to provide first aid and CPR, follow the protocol for that, still calling 911 at the appropriate time. And here we just see some nice visual aids. We can go over this again, properly planning that activity, making sure you have all the equipment, uh, making sure, as we can see here with this, one of the concerns you might have, this is a tennis program, you want to make sure that you have some shade out there if it's a hot day. So uh, athletes uh, who participate in wheelchair tennis, most likely they either have an amputation or they're going to have a spinal cord injury. If they have a spinal cord injury, their uh, autonomic nervous system doesn't operate the same way. Their heat regulation isn't going to be the same. So they may need they need may need an area to get out of the sun. You may need to have some ice buckets on hand for some cooling stations. When we talk about properly planning the activity, part of that we talked about this a minute ago. But you want to develop a, a proper season plan using progressions. So you don't want to start at the highest skill level and just go from there. You want to build your way up to those skills within your sports. Test your athletes to see where their skill level is. Somebody might think they're way ahead of where they actually are. Somebody may be way ahead of where they actually think they are. So you want to test them to see exactly where they are. And that way you can coach them individually because two athletes on the same team might not need the same progressions. They may need different progressions to get to the same place. Written practice plans, absolutely essential. Again, this goes to proper planning. If you write it down, you've got a plan. Um, it is an integral part to risk management. It is an integral part to proper coaching. It's an integral part as you, uh, if you've attended the, pl the uh, planning and goal setting sessions, an integral part to a successful season. So you should have written practice plans. And what that does for you is if something does happen at that practice, you have a written record of what was planned. Um, and if you do a practice plan correctly, once the practice is over, you're going to do some evaluation, write some notes on there, what went well, what didn't go well, uh, and help you plan for the future. So uh, from a risk management standpoint, the written practice plan allows you to have a written record of what was supposed to happen in case something does end up going to court. And of course, even though you have a plan, um, you <laughs> adapt and survive. That's, uh, that's what you have to do in disability sport coaching for sure. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had practices planned for 25 people to show up and 10 show up. Uh, and you have to adjust. Um, you also have to adjust if you have a practice plan for 10 to show up and 25 show up because that you can have a lot of risk management issues there as well. And then finally, again, keep records of your planning and testing. Don't just write a practice plan, throw it away, keep it. I have every practice plan I've ever written uh, electronically. I do them electronically. Um, a lot of people like to use paper. Either way, save them. Save your testing. Um, 
forms that you use. Again, keep that record so in case anything does happen, you can at least justify why you made the decisions you made. Provide the proper instruction. Uh, here is a great visual. We have somebody, a single leg amputee, who's uh, starting to learn to run from another single leg amputee who has mastered the art of running. Uh, if, you, if you have an athlete that's a single leg amputee and, and they want to start engaging in some uh, sprinting and you have absolutely no idea uh, how to coach the biomechanics of sprinting for a single leg amputee, don't do it. <laughs> Find a resource that can help you with it. Uh, make sure that you get them the proper instruction they need. And if you can't provide it, you have to find a way to get it for them or you have to find a way to learn it so then you can then provide it. Um, provide the proper instruction. Uh, you know, customary methods. Uh, you know, obviously we're not trying to say there that uh, you have to, um, you can't be cutting edge. Certainly you can be cutting edge. But you want to make sure you're teaching the fundamentals. You need to teach the fundamentals and beat from and, and grow from there. Um, you need to know the current standards for the sport and use them. Uh, and that pretty much means that you need to be engaged in ongoing training and the current trends in the sport. Uh, when you are providing instruction, make sure it's clear, complete, and consistent. Make sure you're co you're providing that instruction to all the modalities so that. Um, who the people your instruction can hear it, they can see it, and they can do it. People learn different ways, so you need to make sure that you you uh, you instruct to all those different modalities. And again, supervise the instruction that's delegated to others. If you're having volunteers provide instruction, make sure you just don't assume they're doing it properly. Make sure you float the room and and you're checking on them to make sure they're providing instruction, not just from a risk, risk management standpoint, but also from a consistency standpoint. They're using the same language, they're using the same methods, uh, and they're actually teaching the exact same things. Uh, warn of inherent risks. <laughs> so here we have a couple great ones. We have uh, visually impaired soccer, five-a-side soccer on the left. We've got uh, wheelchair rugby on the right. And again, uh, you know, there's a lot of inherent risks in both those activities, as there is in all sport. But it's imperative that you inform the participant. And again, if the participant's a minor, the parents or guardians of what all those risks, risks are. So if it does happen, it's not a complete surprise. And then uh, we've already covered talking to the participant and the parents, but also team meetings to make sure you explain the risks. And also not just the overall risks, but you may be introducing a new drill that could have some inherent risks. You might be training somewhere that's new. Um, when I coached at Shepherd Center, we used to use the parking deck uh, for training, for pushing. And uh, that obviously had some unique risks that we had to go over every single time we went out to the parking deck and usually multiple plot times while we were on the parking deck. Um, make sure you use signs um, and notices and basically all different types of media to make sure that people understand the risks. Uh, you're, anytime you go into a pool, you're going to see a number of signs. Uh, you go into a baseball field, you see signs about foul balls. You go into a gym, uh, typically you're going to see signs that say no dunking. Um, well, with uh, athletes with disabilities, we typically don't have to worry too much about no dunking, but it does happen. We do have athletes with amputations that can dunk, um, but there are risks. And then uh, finally, participation agreements. We'll get into that again in just a moment. But uh, participation agreements are essentially, it's a document that lists all the inherent risks in, in, within the activity and the minor, the participant, and the, if that participant's a minor, parents and or guardians sign off that they understand those risks and accept those risks and ask for permission to participate anyway. All right, here's our little uh, uh, test slide again. Finished files are the results of years of scientific study combined with years of experience. Get two more seconds to commit that to memory. One, and next. All right, coaches' legal duties. Provide a safe physical environment. And these are actual pictures, and I know the picture on the right is a bit blurry, but the picture on the left, that's actually a picture of a um, downhill grade <laughs> 
with apparently a, an alligator at the bottom. So apparently there was a nice hill there uh, going down to some type of uh, area with water that was home to some alligators and they wanted to make sure that uh, people who used wheelchairs knew that uh, they probably shouldn't just go flying down there and splashing in the water for fun because they might be a gator's dinner at the end. And then of course on the right uh, again, I understand it's difficult to see, but what that is, that's just a piece of plywood going up some steps to create an impromptu ramp. And that was actually a picture taken at a special event, and someone thought that that, was, uh, that would uh, meet uh, the requirements for accessibility. certainly doesn't meet ADA requirements, certainly not safe, uh, and that's certainly not something that we would want to promote. And with that, uh, you know, providing a safe and physical environment. If you do see hazardous conditions, uh, you need to remedy them if you can. If you can't remedy them, that's another thing that you need to inform everyone of. Um, you can develop a, if you're going to use the same facility, or even if you're going to use similar facilities, develop uh, an inspection list, a general inspection list, so that you can just go through and you don't have to remember everything. You can just have it right there on a checkoff list and utilize that to make sure that you have a good, safe uh, environment. If you do have to remove or change anything, uh, make sure you do that, but make sure you note it. And that way, if uh, you do that, uh, whatever facility you're using, if it's not yours, you can report it to the man facility management. And hopefully, they can take care of that so you don't have to deal with it the next time. Um, if the facility rules aren't posted, uh, they need to be. And even if they are posted, you need to be reminded of those each and every time that you have uh, a program meeting there. And monitoring the changing environment, uh, you know, this is particularly important relative to weather. Uh, those of you in the Midwest and uh, a lot of us in the South are used to this. The weather can change very, very quickly. So it's important to make sure you monitor that and understand if uh, inclement weather is coming, if uh, you need to enact a lightning plan. Um, you can do that. For a venue, it's uh, some of the things that you want to make sure that you do at a very minimum uh, through your venue walkthrough. If you're using this for the first time or you're using a venue for a special event, or again, every single time you utilize a facility, uh, just do a walkthrough and uh, assess its accessibility. Did anything change? Uh, are the restrooms actually accessible? If they're, if they, even if they are ADA accessible, is someone with a power chair going to be able to get into the accessible stall and close the door? If not, uh, what are the options if they have to have uh, someone assist them in the restroom? What's the water availability? Where is it? Is it water fountains? Do they work? Is it cold? Is it safe? Um, again, noting hazards if there are any. Is there an AED on the premises? If so, where is it? Is it charged? Is it ready to go? Um, these are all things at a very minimum you want to do. Why would you use a, a facility card? Well, the facility card is extremely useful in the event of an emergency because if you do need to call 911, you need to tell them where you are. Even though we have GPS uh, and everybody has a smartphone, almost everybody has a smartphone, and GPS is in there, uh, that's not something we want to rely on. So your facility card and every Every staff, every volunteer or key volunteer should have a facility card so that if an emergency does occur and a call has to be placed to 911, you can simply look at that card, you can give them the address, you can give them the phone number they can call back to, and then you can give them your location within the facility so the card could have a small map of the facility on it uh, that shows the different areas. Some of the things that you need to be sure that you have at uh, each venue for your programs uh, or at each program, you need to make sure you have your first aid kit or uh, an athletic training kit that's well stocked uh, with the uh, minimums there. Uh, you should have a phone. Hopefully, uh, cell phones are fine as long as they're charged and have service. It's always nice to know where the landline is as well, just in case. Uh, water uh, is an important one, and not just water for your participants and your volunteers, but also water for spectators. It is incumbent upon you to make sure that spectators have adequate access to water. Uh, that is one of your responsibilities uh, within uh, a risk management plan. Uh, snacks, if it's appropriate for the length and duration of uh, the event. Um, cups, straws for people who may need those to 
assist them with uh, taking in fluids. Ice or ice packs, not only for injury, but also cooling stations. Again, if you have someone uh, with uh, paralysis, uh, they might have thermoregulation issues, so might need to utilize the ice or ice packs, cool towels uh, to help cool them off in hot weather. Large plastic bags can be used for a number of things. They can be used for the ice packs. They can be used to um, uh, store things. Uh, they can be used to transport water if we need to transport water real quick, you know, more than a cup of water uh, really quickly. But large plastic bags, again, just a, a nice tool to have. Um, a toolkit, a toolkit, uh, this, what you need in a toolkit, you can find in our um, manual sport chair session and uh, a tire pump and a repair kit. That's always good to have so no one has to sit on the sidelines. Um, we should make sure that anyone who's engaged in that activity, whether it's athlete, staff, and volunteer, uh, you should have their participation forms already. Again, and a burn bag. What's a burn bag? Uh, some of you might not be familiar with a burn bag. Well, simply a burn bag is going to have some towels, wet wipes, uh, and a generic change of clothes in case someone has an accident. Um, whether it's a, a bowel bladder accident, whether it's uh, an accident where they uh, vomit and it gets all over their clothes rather than them having to uh, completely stop the activity or, or, or live with that uh, on their clothes, uh, you can help them change, get them cleaned up. And, uh, base, and that's another place where large plastic bags come in. You can put those soiled clothes in those bags and that way they can get home comfortably and safely and, uh, and uh, not have to uh, deal with too many adverse effects from a potential accident. Again, we talked a little bit about inclement weather with changing conditions, uh, and there's a lot of different types of weather emergencies to take into account. You know, here we see heat, tornado, hurricane, lightning, flooding, snow emergencies. Um, uh, you could have cold emergencies too, not just snow emergencies, but a cold emergency. Um, and with that, you need to have policies for all these things. Um, the policies, you know, what's going to, you know, what's your policy? What temperature does, it, what temperature and uh, heat index does it have to get to before you cancel an activity? Where do you go in case there's a tornado? Um, when do you cancel? If there's an impending hurricane that hasn't quite hit but it's coming, at what point do you cancel your program? What type of equipment are you going to use to determine if lightning is getting too close? And what's your policy for resuming activities after the lightning has passed? Uh, flooding, um, again, what's the plan? Snow emergencies, what's the plan? Uh, and with all these things, what are your evacuation routes and procedures in order to get to those safe locations that are predetermined based on these different variables? We talked a little bit about spectators, and again, you are responsible for the safety of your spectators. If you're putting on an event um, that is going to have spectators, you are liable for them. And you're liable for them in the viewing area. You have to make sure that they have that proper access to water. Um, again, protection from the environment. Uh, that's, again, where cooling stations come in, it, whether it's a tent with a chair, possibly a fan, a bucket of ice water, a cooler of ice water with some rags or sponges. Um, you have to make sure that you can provide that uh, you know, first response if there starts to be uh, a medical issue relative to heat uh, or dehydration. What is your plan for emergency medical care? Is it just to dial 911? Are you going to have paramedics on staff? Are you going to have athletic trainers present? Um, just you need to know what the plan is. Everyone needs to know what the plan is. Medical care for spectators. Um, now, when you're, when you're going to have large events, uh, a lot of things come into play with large events. And if you're going to have a large event, obviously the more people you have, the higher likelihood there is that there's going to be a medical emergency. So it is always beneficial to have medical personnel on staff. And a lot of times you can just call your local fire department and they'll be happy to place an ambulance and paramedic crew on site for the event. And if a call comes in, they may have to leave and then your backup plan is to dial 911. But it's always great to have that medical crew on site with a plan for treating not only participants but spectators. Um, and we've actually had that happen in 2007. Play Sports hosted the U.S. Paralympic Track and Field National Championships. 
uh, and we did not have any athlete injuries, but we it was uh, July, it's Atlanta, uh, and it's hot, it's humid, and we did have a heat emergency with a spectator who got overheated and passed out, and we had uh, medical staff on site. We had a number of athletic trainers uh, positioned throughout the field of play and the venue, and we also had uh, paramedics on staff. Within 30 seconds, the person that uh, lost consciousness was a first responder. One of the athletic trainers responded. The paramedics came over and uh, took care of that individual. So it, it worked out very well. The plan we had uh, went into action, and then because it was a good plan, everything turned out all right. Coach's legal duties, again, uh, provide adequate and proper equipment. Uh, here's a great pick of some sledge hockey. Uh, again, sledge, not sled. We only say sled hockey in the United States. The rest of the world calls it sledge hockey. Um, obviously, uh, this can be a dangerous sport too. So uh, you've got the sticks flying. You aren't going to send those guys out there with no gloves or shoulder pads or helmet. And actually, for those of you that don't know, um, the, only, the only equipment – that sledge hockey players don't wear, that able-bodied hockey players wear, are the actual skates. But as you can see at the bottom of that sled, the skate blades are on the bottom of the sled. So the blades are there. Um, all the same equipment is there, and actually there's a little bit more for sledge hockey uh, because each athlete has two sticks, and at the end of those sticks are ice picks that they use to propel themselves on the ice. So uh, possibly an inherently more dangerous sport than hockey, although the speed is a little bit... Uh, lower, but uh, definitely have needs for protective equipment uh, within that sport as well as most sports. And again, we, we touched on this at the beginning of this section. Buy the best equipment you can. Um, obviously, you have to meet minimum standards, uh, but if you can spend a little bit more, do it because it is typically worth the money. Uh, not only should you know how to fit and inspect the equipment, but you need to teach your athletes how to fit and expect the equipment too, especially if you're dealing in youth programs where it is possible that someone could grow three inches over the course of a season. Uh, they might outgrow the equipment that you gave you initially gave them at the beginning of the season. They need to have may need new equipment. You should have a plan to regularly inspect that equipment, whether it's an annual plan, a seasonal plan, or something that occurs more frequently. Um, you need to understand and have a policy for an athlete using personal equipment. Um, qualify people to install and repair. You know, one of the things that first comes to mind with this is, is repairing cracks and frames on wheelchairs. Uh, you want to make sure that, uh, obviously, one, you find the crack in the frame. Two, you take that chair out of service uh, before it's repaired. And then three, you find someone actually qualified uh, to repair that, uh, that crack in the frame. And uh, maybe, uh, you know, Steve's uncle, who does a little... Uh, Artistic welding on the side may not be the person to do that. Uh, whether your chair is made of aluminum, titanium, uh, not as likely, but possible could be made of steel. You need to make sure you take that to someone who is qualified to weld that material and should have a basic understanding of wheelchairs as well so they understand that if that crack is somewhere where a weld just may not do it, uh, that that chair can be taken out of service. Um, Worn athletes on hazardous equipment, obviously gymnastics is something that comes to mind very quickly. Uh, but again, wheelchairs are hazardous equipment. Sit skis, uh, both uh, for water and snow, can be dangerous equipment. Uh, air rifles, archery, uh, field implements, all can be hazardous equipment. And uh, anything that can happen eventually will, and you need to discuss that with your participants. And also, you need to be aware of improving equipment standards. Um, and this can be a drain on resources of a program, but if uh, minimum standards are raised with, in a sport or an activity and you continue to use outdated equipment and something happens, guess what? You just failed to fulfill your legal duty, and you're going to be liable, and you're going to be negligent. You're going to get sued, and you're going to lose. Again, just some of the different equipment that's out there that you need to be um, aware of. I love this pick. Match your athletes appropriately. Now, if we had these two athletes within a single program um, it, and we took 
to this uh, legal duty to the letter of the law, we might say, hey, wait a minute, you know, maybe this isn't a good idea, but this is actually <laughs> a game, uh, a Paralympic level game. And uh, Carly on the left is, uh, or excuse me, Kylie on the left, uh, Australian Paralympian, uh, Jen on the right, uh, a, a U.S. Paralympian. Um, so even though their size is different, they are matched appropriately relative to their skill level and uh, physical maturity. Uh, but if these were two youth, you might want to try to group them up a little bit differently because you do want to avoid a bigger, older, stronger player inflicting injury or harm on a younger, weaker, underdeveloped player. And again, match according to size, age, maturity, skill level, and experience. Uh, modify drills or practice not only with uh, the athletes but also with the equipment as well. You may need to use smaller balls, um, different types of balls, uh, different types of equipment. Here's your file or your slide again. Finished files are the results of years of scientific study combined with years of experience. Memorize it, memorize it. Evaluate your athletes for injury and incapacity. Um, again, athletes want to participate. They want to compete. Uh, many will, will tell you anything they think you need to hear so they can continue to participate. Uh, you need to err on the side of caution. Uh, one of the stories I have on this, a few years back, we took a women's team to the National Wheelchair Basketball Association National Championships. We were doing very well. We were traveling between venues for a game. Uh, I was driving a 15-passenger van. Uh, one of my best players was in the very back of the van. For some reason, had not put her seatbelt on. We're driving down the road uh, below this posted speed limit, and all of a sudden there was a speed table in the road. It was unmarked. There was no sign. Uh, it did not have... Um, it was not painted. It was not uh, hashed off. There was just it was extremely hard to see, and I hit that speed table doing 20 miles an hour. And this athlete bounced up because she didn't have her seatbelt on, hit her head on the very top of the bus of the van, and came back down to her seat, and immediately started complaining of a headache, stiff neck, and uh, you know wasn't quite seeing straight. Now, we're on our way to another game. It's a game for fifth place, and I think we had come in about eighth or ninth place that year, ranked. So we really wanted to do well. We were playing a collegiate team, had a good opportunity to win that game. But, you know, one of my legal duties was to evaluate this athlete for injury or incapacity. And she had just uh, had a head trauma. She complained of her neck hurting, her head hurting. And to me, because uh, I had a well-developed philosophy on this, it was a no-brainer. We took her to the hospital. Uh, she didn't want to go to the hospital, but she also kept complaining of these symptoms. So we took her to the hospital. We went on. We left her there with the qualified staff, took the rest of the team to the game, started the game. As it turns out, she had, uh, she had the proper tests. The emergency room doctor cleared her to play, said she was fine. There was no concussion. There was no damage to her spine or neck, and she was good to go. And I had this written. Emergency room doctor signed off, signed his name to it, said she's good to go. She can play right now. I still didn't put her back in the game until I observed her on the sideline, until I observed her warm up, and I felt comfortable not not that I have a medical degree. I don't have a medical degree. I'm never going to have a medical degree. But uh, ultimately, she's my responsibility, and I cared more about her as a person than I cared about um, our team winning a game. And uh, that's just the way it was, and I have never lost a week of sleep over that because athletes come first, not the sport, not the game, not winning. Um, the person comes first. Some of the things you can do uh, also to fulfill this legal duty, make sure that uh, your, your participants are uh, engaged in pre-participation physical exams, the sports physicals. Uh, you need to make sure that you have a complete medical history on file, including their primary and any secondary disabilities. Um, a lot of times people leave off secondary disabilities that 
could be an issue, behavioral disorders, attention disorders, uh, learning disabilities. Those all come into play, and they're all important to know as you coach individual athletes and deal with individual athletes or participants in your programs. And, you know, this says use extraordinary judgment determining when injured athletes should not participate. Uh, and, you know, don't confuse that. Let me make that real simple. If you have any doubt in your head at all, they don't participate. I mean, it's just you, you, this, you should be overly cautious, overly cautious. A game is just a game. Uh, you know, a person has a whole lifetime that they can engage in sport, recreation, and physical activity. The now is should never take place at the cost of the future. Um, and in terms of return to play, when an athlete is removed due to injury, um, you have to have medical approval for them to return to play. If anything, is, especially if anything has been diagnosed medically, uh, if, some, if, a, if a medical professional has diagnosed a condition that has removed them from play, then that uh, medical professional needs to sign that back into play. And then just, again, just as I as a coach wouldn't put a player back in just because a doctor said, okay, she, that she could go back in, just because a doctor says she can go, a person can go back in, you also want the parents to be on board with that as well. Because, again, the right now, the sport, the physical activity – isn't as important as living a long, healthy life for an individual with or without a disability. Some of the different information that you want to gather and keep on file of your athletes, obviously general contact information, emergency contacts, uh, that's plural. It's always good to have multiple emergency contacts. Uh, and again, primary, secondary disability, all the medications they take, uh, and if there are any recent surgeries, and um, it's always important if you're going to be doing a program where you have any type of overnight activities, you want to go over the medications and current conditions, current health conditions verbally, not just take the, the, uh, the medical records word for it. Talk about that with the participant, talk about it with the uh, parents, guardians, Make sure that uh, they have provided all the medications that uh, that person is taking at the time. Are there any allergies? If you do have allergies, uh, what are the symptoms if, uh, if you come in contact with that allergen? Do you have an EpiPen? Where do you keep the EpiPen? How do you administer the EpiPen? All these things should have a policy and should be part of your program policy. Um, should have current status of all the different types of immunizations, including tetanus. Are there any implanted devices, pumps, um, any type of medical equipment that need we need to know about? Uh, again, have that signed consent for participation on hand and with you whenever you're uh, dealing with a program. Um, and again, if you're doing an overnight, if you're traveling, if something does happen, you do need to try those emergency contact numbers and get authorization to seek medical attention for a minor. Now, obviously, if you are in an emergent situation and you cannot reach anyone, uh, you just simply need to go ahead and do it. And you always have the ability to call 911 and let the medical professionals determine if treatment needs to be provided immediately. Um, you never, never risk someone's life um, simply to make a phone call. Uh, you know, depending on how emergent the situation is, the phone call is either going to come first or second. You need to use your good judgment with that. That pre-performance exam, pre-performance participation exam, um, you get that sports physical, but uh, in addition to that, um, that will give you an athlete's general health. Uh, as you start the program, you can test them to evaluate their general level of fitness to make sure that you're asking them to do the appropriate things. And if there's a gap between where they should be and where they are, you can design a program for them to build their fitness level up so that they can get into the, the standard um, activities of the program without, without uh, possible harm to themselves. What areas of predisposition to injury do they have? Uh, have? Have they had any issues previously that we need to be concerned with? Um, 
any areas we need to closely supervise. Uh, for instance, someone possibly have had shoulder surgery. Does someone just have a shunt surgery or a shunt revision? Does someone have a valcofen pump? Does someone have a colostomy bag? All not necessarily injuries, but uh, areas that uh, require close supervision. Um, and really, this should be done at a very minimum every two years. Uh, ideally, you're doing this every year or when health conditions change, um, but at a, at a very minimum every two years. And health conditions, you know, what can be some of the health conditions that change? Could have had surgery, could have grown, um, could have experienced a, a, another disabling condition, could have had an illness. Uh, you know, anything that changes that health condition uh, is going to be something that requires a different pre performance exam. And again, we went over this. Supervise the activities closely. Don't rely on, uh, don't rely on assumption. Uh, do your job. Make sure you're supervising the participants, the volunteers, the staff, uh, everyone that's there. And again, just some points to consider when when you think about what is active supervision. Um, and a special note, item four there, do not condone reckless or overly aggressive behavior. Uh, ignoring it is condoning it. Laughing at it is condoning it. Participating in it is condoning it. So you need to make sure if that's happening that you address it, you address it immediately and make sure that everyone understands why that behavior is not acceptable and dangerous. Boy, it would be awesome if we had all these people for a program. Um, there's some professional teams that don't have all these people for their program. Um, and, you know, ideally when we talk about adapted sport, disability sport, if you have more than a coach who also functions as the administrative support and the program coordinator, you're doing well. Uh, ideally, this is what you could have but uh, that is a pie in the sky most of the time. You're doing really great if you have a program coordinator, some administrative support, and a coaching staff. And again, participation forms, uh, you need not just for the athletes, but also for the coaches and staff, should have the same types of information that are on there. And it's extremely important that for your coaches and your staff, you provide them or at least point them in the direction of ongoing training. Uh, this makes sure uh, one, for orientation safety pro protocols, that could be relative to your specific agency or organization. That could be relative to the specific program. That could be relative to the sport. Uh, management of emergencies, what are your policies and procedures? Um, ongoing training of athletes, uh, that could be sport specific. Uh, certification programs, obviously. Uh, this program, the Certified Disability Sports Specialist Program, is something that anyone engaged in disability sport uh, could engage in and make themselves uh, make themselves more capable of providing safe and effective programming. Your volunteers should also fill out the same forms. Uh, you should use, utilize background checks on your volunteers if they're going to be in contact with minors. Um, the National Council of Youth Sports has a great background check program, and you can check that at ncys.org. Uh, training for your volunteers as well. Obviously, if it's a if it's a special event, if it's an ongoing program, if it's a if it's a, one of your super volunteers, there also needs to be orientation relative to the program, the safety protocols for them. And if these are volunteers that are going to be part of your program day in, day out, week in, week out, again, look for ongoing training for them and certification programs. Officials, you know. Officials are often a group that is overlooked in sport and recreation programs from a risk management standpoint. And uh, as you can see here, it, it is really important to note that their primary responsibility is for the athlete's safety on the field of play. Um, and I think if more people understood that, and internalize that, we have a lot less people um, getting angry with officials because, uh, yes, it's their responsibility to officiate, but 
one of the outcomes of that officiating is is to maintain a safe environment for the athletes. So um, that is something that should be brought up every now and then. And of course, if you're hiring officials for 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 your events, you need to have their emergency contact information as well because. Unfortunately, there have been times when officials have had medical emergencies uh, during during an event, and you want to make sure that you have that information so that you can attend to them as quickly and as appropriately as you would your athletes, your staff, your volunteers. Again, provide appropriate emergency assistance. And just once again, don't do anything you're not trained to do, although you should be trained at a minimum in first aid and CPR. And uh, after that, uh, if it uh, goes beyond those uh, that call for those duties, 911. If you are trained to provide appropriate emergency assistance, um, right from the get-go of a program, you should have a consent form that says uh, you are allowed to provide uh, that emergency assistance. If there is an emergency, hopefully you do have an emergency action plan. And uh, we do have on our website, we have some examples of what should be included in an emergency action plan. You can go to our resources page and uh, uh, start a program. And we have some uh, information from the National Athletic Trainers Association. And you can get some good information on emergency action plans there. Um, Transfer of treatment, that simply means that if you are a first responder, if you are trained in CPR, first aid, and first responder training, uh, that you provide that treatment until you transfer, transfer it to the next medical professional, whether that's paramedics or you take them to the hospital yourself. And you obviously should have an injury or incident report form that gets uh, filled out every time an incident occurs, again, to keep that record in case there are any issues coming back legally after the fact. You have a record of what was done, why it was done, who, was done, who performed it, and what happened. Uh, in terms of medical coverage, again, uh, for anyone you have engaged in, in the program as, as uh, ongoing staff, uh, whether it's coaches, staff, or even volunteers, they should have current uh, training uh, in first aid and CPR. Uh, first responder is it was a huge plus. You should have a medical committee uh, for your organization if you are if you do are providing uh, sports teams, ongoing sports programs, or having uh, or putting on large events. Uh, that should be a separate organi organizational committee that deals with all things medical. Uh, and someone that head of that committee should be a medical professional, uh, whether it's an athletic trainer or a physician or a PT or an OT, someone that uh, has the, the background necessary to do the work of that committee and make sure that your emergency action plan and uh, your first response plans are uh, appropriate. And it's always nice to develop relationships with uh, the fire department, uh, paramedic groups, uh, the emergency response teams and service providers, uh, because, again, if you do develop those relationships, it is generally fairly easy to make a phone call well in advance and have them stage an ambulance crew at your event, and they will stay there and deal with those emergencies for you unless they get a call and then they have to go out. So. Uh, that is something that is good to do. Developing partnerships is always, always a good thing in disability sport. If you do have a medical emergency, obviously, the first thing you want to do is recognize when an emergency exists and so that you can quickly assess the situation. And when you assess that situation, the first thing you want to do is make sure that uh, everyone is out of harm's way, that nothing additionally can happen. Uh, and then as you evaluate that, call emergency services and initiate first aid. Now, obviously, if you are trained in CPR and first aid, and for some reason you come across someone that's unconscious, uh, you're going to evaluate them very quickly if you are trained in CPR and first aid before you call that 911 to make sure that if they do need some resuscitation, that that does occur, and then call 911. Waiver forms. Some of the things about waiver forms, which most people use, uh, it's important to note that minors cannot enter to a contract and parents cannot waive 
a minor's right to sue. And that's really what waivers are. Uh, it's a contract between the participant that says, hey, no matter what happens, I'm not going to sue you. Well, a minor can't enter into a contract and parents can't waive a minor's right to sue. So waiver forms for minors uh, really may not be worth that much. And we've seen a lot of times, court history has seen that uh, contracts that waive negligence don't stand up. Um, but of course, participation agreement won't stand up either if you're negligent. But uh, also, uh, waiver forms, we've seen that um, public policy um, public policy doesn't often agree with the language that's in the waiver forms. Um, and that's for all these different reasons. And again, it's, that's not to say you should never ever use a waiver form, but there are some drawbacks to waiver forms. And that's why one of the things that we do within this session is, is we try to lean you towards participation agreements. And here's just a great visual of a confidence course. We had uh, some of our uh, blazers on uh, where they're all on this balance board and they're trying to get uh, uh, situated so that they got they have the board completely balanced on that uh, upended uh, square 4x4 four four down there. And again, this was a confidence course. They're doing zip line, they're doing uh, a rope wall, they're doing this. And uh, we didn't have them do waiver forms, we had them do a participation agreement. And some of the aspects of a participation agreement, it's not a contract. And again, we talked about this a little bit easier. It's, it's kind of following all those, all those nine duties we talked about and some of the duties uh, just relative to risk management. Um, it, it talks about the inherent risks. Um, it, uh, it, it's there to make sure that the people requesting the ability to participate understand the consequences of that risk, what those injuries could be, uh, that death may even be one of the results of participating in this activity. Um, it, participation agreements either are going to outline or part of that is going to be for the participant to acknowledge that they know the rules and procedures and the importance of following them. And finally, what after going through all of this, the final part of the participation agreement is that the undersigned are saying that they know all this information, they've been presented with all this information, and even at that point, they're requesting permission to participate in the sport or the activity. Okay, one more time. Finished files are the results of years of scientific study combined with years of experience. If you haven't memorized yet, don't cheat. It's another example where there's some major risk management issues doing some rock climbing here. Give this to you one more time. Finished files are the results of years of scientific study combined with years of experience. Okay, the test is coming up here very shortly. This is just a great picture. It has nothing to do with disability sport or risk management, uh, with the exception of possibly burning your hands on the sun. So you've got those slides, and I'm going to mix it up a little bit. I told you you need to memorize it. Well, hopefully you memorized it, because now what I need you to do is tell me or write down how many Fs are in that phrase. How many F's? From your memory, I'll give you five more seconds. Three, two, one. How many F's were on that slide? I asked you to memorize all those times. I think it was about five or six times I showed you that slide. How many F's were in it? Some people are probably saying three, four, five. Well, how many were there? Finished files are the results of years of scientific study combined with years of experience. One, two, three, four, five, six Fs. Six Fs. Well, why do we do this? You know, what was the point of that? And the point of that was that when we talk about risk management, the devil is in the details. You can't overlook things. You can't assume. You need to pay attention to all the minutia. And if you don't, Something is going to happen, someone's going to get hurt, and someone's going to get sued. So make sure that 
you in understand what negligence is, you understand the role of risk management, you understand the risk management process, and you certainly understand the nine legal duties of coaches. If you understand all those things and develop policies and procedures to abide by them, you're going to have a safe and effective program. No one's going to, well, I shouldn't say no one's going to get hurt in sport, recreation, physical activity. People get hurt. That's the nature of sport. It happens. But it should not happen because of someone's negligence. That should never happen. That can be prevented. And that's what we really need to aim to do. Um, hopefully, you've uh, learned a few things from this session. If you do have any questions on it, please feel free to email me or call me. You can email me at dhumphreys at blazesports.org. And you can reach us at 404-270-2000. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.